What's going on guys, Joshua Gibson here with the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast and today I am joined by Danny Lennon from Sigma Nutrition. How you doing Danny? I'm great Joshua, thanks so much for having me on the yeah. show. Yeah, no problem. And um, if you could just you know, quickly give a, a background um, uh, about your education, maybe your competitive history if you've ever competed in any sports and maybe what got you into the field of um, spoiler nutrition sure so um I, I suppose like a lot of people it's probably a bit of a zigzag of a journey it's never straightforward so I'll, I'll try and keep it a bit condensed or as much as i can um my original interest in getting into this field came out with my own hobbies which were always interested in sports so growing up i played a ton of different uh, team sports and um, so i played a lot of soccer i uh, played a lot of gaelic football which is a, a sport over here in ireland um, and had, had really been uh, focused on getting better in those uh, aspects. Um, I originally then went to university to study um, uh, biology and physics. And so during that time, I obviously got exposed to learning how to read through scientific uh, research, uh, evidence-based methods, et cetera, et cetera. And so really in my own time outside of college, I was dipping into research papers and journals and reading about sports performance and things that could help me in uh, in my goal in athletics and and during that time I'd also started going to the gym to kind of supplement some of that stuff um, and I gradually moved away from more of the field based sports and, and during my time in in college started getting into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and MMA and, and started taking lifting a bit more seriously to, to help those things um, and one of the big things that stood out for me when I was looking at things to help performance was this whole nutrition piece and that really got me interested in diving more and more into that. So following graduating from college, I actually graduated as a science teacher. Uh, so I was teaching in a high school over here for a year, teaching biology and physics. Um, and a, but there was something about this nutrition thing that kept pulling me back towards nutrition and sports nutrition. So I decided to go back and get my master's degree in nutritional sciences um, and, and just continued from there to learn more and more about this field of nutrition. So that's how that all came about. Uh, I founded my own uh, consultancy. And then uh, Sigma Nutrition, the, the company I have now, it really is kind of two-pronged part. We have uh, our online coaching where we work with various different athletes and general population people. Uh, but then the other kind of side of the company is more around education and putting out evidence-based information for other nutritionists, for dietitians, for personal trainers, strength coaches, just athletes. Uh, we do that through uh, our podcasts, articles. Uh, we run seminars and workshops. So there's kind of those two main things on, on the kind of the business side. Um, and then I suppose the final thing would be uh, for myself personally, in, in terms of uh, I mentioned some of my uh, athletic background, uh, following kind of going through college, um, I had a pretty bad injury to my shoulder or it tore my labrum in my shoulder. So that put me out of uh, being on the mats and grappling for quite a while. And during the rehab for, for that, I started lifting a bit more and, and trying to take that more seriously to try and help with with the rehab and just got more and more into that and so really over the past uh, few years uh, i have stayed away from mma and brazilian jiu-jitsu and really my main passion right now in terms of sports is powerlifting and so i've com been competing fairly uh, regularly for the over the past couple of years um and uh competed in an ipf affiliate here in ireland and uh, yeah that's my main interest sports wise right now and so I think, yeah, that gives maybe some context for uh, a bit around my background uh, without getting too detailed. Sure. Um, so that's kind of, like you said, that was your background. What are your plans going forward um, with Sigma? And then um, maybe do you plan on continuing to compete in powerlifting? Um, kind of what you have in mind for the next next year? Yeah, sure. So on a personal side, definitely competitive wise, I'm very much focused on continuing to compete. Um, so uh, I'll probably have a meet in early December uh, of this year. So we're probably what nine, ten weeks away at this stage. And then our national championships are on next February, I believe. So that'll be kind of the next uh, big meet to aim towards. So that's the thing that's most um, in line next for my own uh, personal goals. Uh, and then with Sigma Nutrition, we continue to grow the coaching side of the business for sure. Uh, I have two great coaches working alongside me, uh, Gar Ben and Arthur Lynch, who do a lot of the training program and nutritional programming for a lot of our clients. So continuing to grow our, our base out there 
And uh, we've also got a lot of seminars and workshops coming up over the next kind of year's time. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, educational stuff that I want to continue pushing out. Uh, so over this past year, I, I uh, put out a book on weight cutting for MMA and boxing uh, athletes. Uh, and that went down extremely well. And a lot of the foundational nutritional practice and, and weight cutting strategies were detailed there. And so the goal now is to do something for strength athletes in the same uh, arena because that's been one of the main questions that uh, a lot of people have had about it. If I'm not someone that's having to compete in a sport like MMA, but instead I'm going to do a powerlifting meet or a weightlifting meet and I have two hours between weigh-ins, what might this change in my weight cut or how might my nutrition change? So the idea is to put out something probably uh, just in the new year on that. Uh, and they're the kind of main projects that I'm working on right now, but uh, that's all subject to change. I, I don't tend to plan too far ahead. I'm not a long-term planner, uh, but they're definitely the next few things on, on the list. Okay. And then it, kind of with Sigma Nutrition, um, you've really um, kind of built a place for that company and it's grown tremendously. And, uh, you know, it, it's probably a business that a lot of people look up to and try and kind of uh, recreate what you guys do because you've been so successful. Um, what what is you what ha, what do you think was the turning point for Sigma? Like, do you think um, there was like this point where it just kind of um, exploded and, and 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 suddenly became popular? Or do you think it was gradual and kind of you just slowly built a following? I mean, was there was there anything there that um, was noticeable? Yeah, it's interesting uh, the way you kind of phrase that question because I think for a lot of people on the outside, uh, especially over the past year, uh, a lot of people have seen uh, the company being talked about more and more and, and people are more familiar with it. And it seems that it kind of came out of nowhere. But it's really been this kind of slow, steady build-up process over really the last three and a half, nearly four years now from uh, when the company started. And, and the same with the podcast, which is what most people at least initially get to know us for is the podcast. And obviously that's been hugely successful and, and probably more so than uh, I would have thought at, at this point. And a lot of that is down through just consistently and, and putting in work and trying to make sure that the work is good quality. And so for the consistency piece, I could say we've been going since April 2014. So yeah, like three and a half years at this stage, a bit more. And pretty much every single week, there's been a podcast out every Tuesday. A couple of weeks here and there, it might be on a Wednesday or Thursday. And I think maybe there's been one week, maybe two at most, over that three and a half year window where the podcast didn't come out on that, that given week. So it's been a, a case of consistency there. It's been sticking to the values that we wanted to do as opposed to what maybe might sound more, I don't know, sexy or easier to pull people in or more a bit clickbaity, trying to stick to our principles of solid, sensible information that's evidence-based that will actually help people. Um, and just doing that over time and then just people being aware of it. And, and once they see that it continues to do that, then I think that that's just how it's built. And all of our following and listenership has, has pretty much been built totally organically. Um, we'll, and the goal was always for from each month to month to grow how many listeners and how many downloads we had for the podcast. Uh, rather than looking for these big massive spikes just continue to grow and we've accumulated that over time and uh, now here we are yet yeah, it's, it's thankfully in a very uh, good position but it's just down to the same old cliches people hear all the time hard work consistency and, and making sure that your work is of good quality and if you have those three things then uh, I think then maybe the other piece is always going to be luck right and I think people can underestimate that and I certainly don't try and underestimate how how lucky I'm in to be in this position and luck has probably played a part in as a lot of occasions along that way uh, where I've had a chance meeting with someone or something has happened that was something I, I couldn't plan or expect uh, but you dramatically increase your chances of that luck I think when you consistently do something that's good quality and that you care about and try and make it better and that's it there was no other secret formula behind it apart from that right and uh, I think the key when you put out quality information that's not clickbaity and and has a lot of value is you retain a lot more a lot more clients and customers and, and people that are just interested in what you do it's not just kind of this this machine where you just crank people out because they kind of buy in and then they don't get the results they want and then they leave you know it's, it's very consistent and reliable so and that's that's why I'm excited to have you on I mean um, you're you're kind of the model uh, for for building a high quality evidence-based uh, business 
and um, I, I, I take you as an expert in nutrition, so that's why I'm excited to, to kind of dive into um, the topic at hand. So just and thank you for those kind words. Yeah, no problem. To hear man. that. Thank you. No problem. And uh, so just for the listeners that maybe aren't too familiar, if we could just start discussing like um, the basic principles of nutrition and maybe if we could differentiate um, for changes in body composition versus changes in health and, and kind of how those how those differ. Sure. So uh, I suppose the big thing is to think about when we're looking at what nutrition actually is for and, and what it's going to provide. Obviously, we're talking about what food we consume. There's a, typically people come at it from the perspective of there's these set of good foods that we should eat lots of and bad foods that we, we shouldn't eat or these will make you fad and unhealthy. So I think to try to, to start to piece this all together, I would say that to have an overall good quality healthy diet, there's a number of different aspects or subtopics underneath this umbrella term nutrition or diet that we can talk about that have an influence. So we have things like your overall uh, caloric intake or more accurately your energy balance, your calories in versus your expenditure, uh, your macronutrients, so how much protein, carbohydrate and fat you're consuming, how much fiber are you consuming, uh, your micronutrients, so the vitamins and minerals that are within those foods, how much of that those are you consuming. You could look at hydration is probably going to affect both health uh, and to maybe a to lesser degree body composition. Uh, we can look down to then supplementation both on for health for uh, vitamins and we can look at uh, supplements for performance as well. All these different aspects to nutrition can influence your end result whether that's a health-based goal or a body composition-based goal. But not all of those things are equal in how much proportionally they provide towards that result. So some things are going to provide much more of the end result than others. And so from a starting point, if we're just looking where should we start with this whole thing, we should think of, okay, which of those core components provide the most bang for your buck or, or what is most going to determine your end result? Make sure we have those in place and then look at the smaller details afterwards. Whereas so often, as I'm sure you're aware, most people tend to go the opposite. They look at the small little details. They ask you about what supplements they should be taking. They ask you about what specific times of the day I need to time these nutrients. What intra-workout shake should I be consuming? All these small details that can have some very real effects, but very minor in comparison to bigger pieces of the puzzle, like just how many overall calories do you consume on average each day? How much protein are you consuming each day for your body weight? So uh, we have these clear kind of different factors that influence nutrition, where we can differ these maybe on health versus body composition is proportionally how much each of those things matter for each of those things. And so there's been some great work uh, done on this uh, with people that I'm sure your listeners might be uh, familiar with. Eric Helms has published his uh, pyramids for a, essentially a hierarchy of importance for nutrition. Uh, Mike Isretel has done something very similar uh, with uh, Renaissance periodization where they have those different factors and they assign percentages to how much of those different factors contribute to an end goal. And the difference when we look at body composition and health is that the order of that hierarchy might change. So to, to get practical and a bit more specific, when you're talking about um, body composition uh, very specifically, it's pretty clear from the literature that the thing that is most going to dictate changes in at least body weight um, and as a kind of close proxy, uh, your either gain of body fat or loss of body fat or gain of muscle, et cetera, et cetera, the main thing you want to look at is your overall energy balance. How many calories are you taking in versus your expenditure? So this is going to be the number one thing to take care of for most people. The reason why is that if you don't have this correct, you could be doing everything else right and you're not going to be getting towards your goal. As an example, the foods you consume could be the best quality in the world. You could be getting a really micronutrient dense diet. You could be consuming enough water every day. You could have every supplement that you want under the sun. You could be timing these at the perfect times and around your workouts. But if your goal is to lose body fat and you're simply consuming too many calories every day, you can't lose body fat because it's the, this first fundamental principle that you haven't taken care of. So first thing is to look at overall caloric intake how, and is that getting you towards your goal or away from your goal. 
as a very basic idea and something everyone will probably be familiar with, we have calories in versus calories out. This still holds true and is a pretty good place for most people to start that if you want to lose body fat over time, you generally want to be consuming less calories than you're expending. So you want to be in a calorie deficit or reducing how many calories you consume in comparison to your normal amount of calories that would maintain your body weight. In reverse, if you want to gain weight, and uh, if, for example, you're trying to go through a, a gain of muscle mass, the, probably the best environment to do that is in a slight calorie surplus. So slightly more calories than you would typically maintain your normal body weight at will give those extra resources towards building uh, muscle mass. So getting that in place as your starting point for body composition is probably the best place to go. After that, we, we could go right through that list. Probably you could get most of the results if you get those calories in place. And then where might be a slight difference is for body composition, get those macronutrients uh, in, in a decent proportion for your goal. So for most people listening who are probably going to be interested in some sort of strength sport and are going to be training regularly, they get their calories right, they're doing their uh, regular training. You want to look at probably of the macronutrients, protein intake is first place to go. Make sure you have a, a good intake of protein. Uh, we can talk about uh, that maybe later if you want to get into protein specifically. Uh, so you're probably looking at somewhere between 1.6, maybe up to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. So um, uh, apologies for not being able to translate it into pounds for you guys. Um, that's just setting your protein intake. And then you can base your carbohydrate and fat intakes on the individual and their general activity, maybe what type of training phase they're going through. But making sure you have enough protein in your diet to recover from training sessions, you have enough carbohydrate to fuel the type of training you're doing. And then you go down that list. So next might be, uh, if you look at, for example, Eric Helms' list, you'd have calories, then you have your macronutrients would be the next thing to look at, then micronutrients. So making sure the foods you consume are providing you with a decent amount of vitamins and minerals. So not just relying on junk food all the time, maybe getting some vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. And then you move along that list. Meal timing would be your next consideration when you have meals, making sure you're eating protein in around the workout, uh, maybe having some carbohydrate during a really tough training session, things like that. And then the final piece would be supplementation. Um, so the, the whole idea with these hierarchies that either Eric has or that Mike has is that you start at the big things like calories, which have the proportionally will affect your results the most. You get that stuff in place and then realize that the things at the top can still influence it. So the timing of your meals and supplementation, for example, can still in, impact your end result, but proportionally it's very small. So if you're someone that's just starting out with this nutrition stuff, focus most of your mental energy on making sure you're generally eating an appropriate amount of calories and that you're consuming enough protein for your goal rather than spending all your time worrying about supplementation before you have the other stuff taken care of. Um, so again, I don't know if the answer to the question. The other part was around differences with health. With health, you could probably make a case that uh, calories are still maybe the most important because, again, if someone's chronically consuming too many calories, that leads to excess body fat uh, uh, accrual. It might lead to insulin resistance, things of, the, of this nature. After that, you could probably make a case that rather than macronutrients being as important per se, there's a wide range of macronutrient breakdowns that people can actually be pretty healthy on. And, and so you could probably make a case that overall food quality might be more important in, in, in that relation. But generally, the hierarchies can be pretty similar. And if someone is eating in a way that's going to maintain a good quality body composition, and at the same time, the majority, not all, but the majority of their food is pretty good quality. And I think most adults will know like that vegetables, lean meats, eggs, fruits, this type of stuff is, is generally good quality stuff. If you have a decent amount of that stuff in your diet and you're eating to maintain a healthy body composition, you're probably going to be doing pretty well. And you're probably healthy from a nutritional perspective. Uh, maybe a few minor things you could tweak afterwards, but uh, there's not all that much difference. So uh, I know there was a lot there and maybe we can get into any of the specifics, but just for that would be the first place I, I'd tell people to look. Realize that there's all these things that can influence your health and your body composition from a nutritional point of view but they're not all equal. Some have a, a larger role than others, and they're the things to focus first and foremost on. And if people want a nice uh, visual representation of that, I'd point them towards Eric Helms' uh, nutritional pyramid um, or look at the stuff that Mike Isertel is a very kind of similar hierarchy uh, with a pyramid uh, picture as well. So 
that be a good place to start. Okay. And that was a very thorough, um, that was a great explanation. And uh, you, you were able uh, to kind of break it down really well. So the first thing that, the first question that comes to my mind, um, I've seen, seen some research about um, protein intake and how like very, very high protein intakes can often uh, offset um, like a high, hypercaloric diet. Um, kind of what's, what's your opinion on that? And um, do you think there's something there with protein being like this, this macronutrient that isn't treated similarly to a carbohydrate or a fat? Yeah, sure. So uh, this is a good point, and, and this kind of speaks to the idea that when we say the most important thing is calories and we're looking at calories in and calories out, a lot of people try and paint that as a black and white argument and say, well, not all foods are created equal. And that's completely correct. Uh, but no one is, is actually making the point that everything is equal. Mm -hmm. We know different foods have different influences, and most predominantly that's down to their macronutrient composition. So that's why that kind of second piece of that hierarchy is looking at the actual macronutrient breakdown of your food. So the, the kind of research you, you're talking about there is in the cases where they've had people overfeed, mm -hmm. so have a hypercaloric or a calorie surplus, a uh, hypercaloric diet, but having more of that calories coming from protein seems to be less fattening than if they were to overfeed on one of the other macronutrients. And uh, there's certainly been some interesting research that has kind of indicated this um, uh, Joey Antonio out of Florida has produced some of this stuff, as, as well as a couple of other groups uh, in a similar vein. And there could be a number of different explanations for what's going on. Uh, those papers weren't able to elucidate exactly the mechanisms why this might be happening. Uh, but we could definitely speculate on a few. I think one is when you look at macronutrients, why they are treated differently. One of those differences is, is in something called a thermic effect of feeding. So this is essentially how many calories your body expends just to digest these different nutrients. And so it actually will expend a different amount of calories for these different uh, nutrients, these different uh, macronutrients, and use up different amounts of energy. The one that you use the most for is, is protein. So this has the highest thermic effect of feeding or the, the high, highest therm uh, thermogenic effect, which means that when you eat protein, you actually use more calories to burn that up than you would for the same amount of calories coming from carbohydrate or fat. And so it could be because the uh, protein in the diet is so high in these uh, trials that these people are expending more energy to break that down. And that's almost certainly happening, but how much of that is contributing to not putting on, on fat might be another thing. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, in general, um, in the real world, if you were to tell someone to go on a super high protein diet and they weren't tracking and trying to hit a specific number of calories, what can often happen is they won't overeat by as much or they won't hit as high amount of calories in general because protein has a very high satiety effect. And so it's going to mean that they're going to get to a point where they feel a bit fuller or they're not going to feel as hungry and it's going to be harder to overeat on those types of foods. So if people think of all the foods that are the most easy to overeat on, they typically tend to be highly processed foods that are probably both high in carbohydrate and fat probably have lots of salt and flavoring, low in fiber and low in protein, because those things are very palatable to us. They're very easy to eat and they're very easy to overeat on as well. So it could be a case of in the real world, if someone has a super high protein intake, they're just not going to have those same, uh, the same satiety levels or the same hunger levels as someone that's on a, a low protein diet, for example. So there's definitely something to that, and it, it's a case of right now, if someone were to overeat um, on more of a certain macronutrient, you could probably make a case that if you overeat more so on protein than the other two, then that may be less fattening. But uh, the flip side of that, I would say to people, is it doesn't mean that just because you have a high protein diet that you can't gain body fat. And certainly, if you overeat on calories, regardless of where they come from, you can gain body fat if the calories are high enough. So if the calorie surplus is large enough, you can do so. Uh, people talk about the, the point that it's harder to convert protein into stores of, uh, uh, stored body fat than it is for the, some of the other macronutrients. And, and again, this is true, but the point being that even if you're in a calorie surplus and you have this, all this extra protein, 
even when that isn't going directly to uh, di- uh, stores of body fat, you have the other carbohydrate and fat that's probably in your diet that can then be stored anyway. So I think if you're going to be in a large calorie surplus, if it's large enough, you will be able to gain weight regardless of how high a diet uh, you're in protein. Uh, but if someone did want to go and go into an overfeeding state, you're probably looking at high protein might have an effect. Uh, but one other thing I would say to people is uh, going on these super high calorie diets or like old school bulking phases to gain weight is probably not an optimal strategy anyway. So it kind of makes this whole point moot in that to if you want to go on a, a gaining phase right now, the amount that you over need to overeat by isn't actually as large as a lot of people think. To go into a gaining phase, you're probably looking at only a couple of hundred calories for a lot of people. Uh, it's not that large of a calorie surplus you need. And, and again, to talk about Eric Helms, he has a great quote that sums this up. He talks about um, calories are not the thing that are going to be driving your gains in muscle mass. Calories are just permissive. So you need that calorie surplus to have that kind of optimal anabolic environment to gain muscle. That will be the best state. But the amount that you need to overeat by isn't actually like super high. So it's not a case of the more you overeat by and the larger your calorie surplus, the more muscle mass you gain. It's You can only gain at a certain rate anyway, and that's going to be very much limited uh, regardless of how much you overeat by. So if you overeat by 400 calories per day versus you overeat by 2,000, you probably gain the same amount of muscle mass in that time, but you'd probably just gain a ton more body fat with the 2,000 calorie surplus, for example. So that's what I would say to people that it can have an influence, but if you are in a smart gaining phase anyway, then you probably aren't going to be in a huge calorie surplus. And so the your amount of body fat you're, you're going to be gaining should be relatively minimal. There will be some, but it should be relatively minimal anyway, which uh, kind of gets rid of the whole worry about how much should I overeat by on this nutrient versus this nutrient. Okay, so that's looking at... Um looking at it from one end of the spectrum with higher amounts of protein, if we take a, um, a diet that matches caloric intake to caloric expenditure, um, so it's isocaloric, would there be any effect of having too much fat in the diet as opposed to too much protein? Or is that still kind of just a, a matter of calories in versus calories out? Because I know when people don't track their nutrition, typically they're going to get a lot more fat than, than uh, they would kind of expect. Sure. So if someone's in a state of whether at like calorie maintenance or a level that's going to maintain their, their body fat, I would first look at what is their protein intake regardless of what the other macronutrients are doing. So making sure that's not super low because that can again cause problems if it's, it's very low. Um, and in fact, there's actually been some cool studies where they've had people on very low protein diets and actually overfed them so in a calorie surplus. And some of the subjects were actually able to lose muscle mass despite being in a calorie surplus, which is kind of crazy, purely just because their their protein intake was so low. It was like less than 40 grams per day or something ridiculous. So uh, for back to our kind of uh, idea of at maintenance level of calories, you're looking at a protein intake that's, again, suitable for the individual. If we're going with people who are lifting in the gym, who have some sort of goals towards maximizing uh, muscle mass and strength, while sailing relatively lean, I think a good starting point for a lot of people is probably around uh, an easy figure is like two grams per kilogram of body weight, which would be fairly close to that kind of old school one gram per pound. Uh, it'd actually be slightly a bit less than that. But that's a really good starting point for a lot of people. Um, I think you can make the case that if someone's in a calorie surplus or at maintenance, you are, can probably even go a small bit lower. But getting in around that so for pound maybe something like 0.8 to 0.9 grams per pound of body weight is probably perfectly fine you could make a case that for particularly for very lean individuals and athletes who are in a dieting phase or in a calorie deficit that you might want to increase the protein intake a bit more in those cases just to offset some of that uh, but to go back to your original uh, question if they're in calorie maintenance and they're eating protein at that level that we've just described then I don't think there's going to be any uh, issue with where exactly their fat intake is in, in relation to carbohydrates. So, for example, if they prefer to have a bit lower of uh, carb intake and a bit higher on fats versus if they prefer to go on a lower fat diet and higher carb diet, 
based on just their food preferences, changes in actual fat mass probably won't be any different unless those things cause a change in some other variable. So where that could happen is if you were to match all those things and all variables stay the same, uh, carb, uh, so protein is the same, calories are the same, their activity levels are the same, sleep is the same, everything is the same, but you just change carbohydrate and fat levels up and down, it's probably, it, it won't change their level of body body fat or, or body composition really in any meaningful way. So it's not worth worrying about and they can really put it more in preference. Where it could have an impact in the real world though is if you have an athlete who is on maybe a low carb diet and is in a very high volume training phase and now because of their very low carbohydrate intake, they can't actually put as much into their training sessions and can't train as hard. Maybe they can't get as many sets done so now they're actually doing less training volume. So all these different variables will impact their end result in terms of body composition. So you could make a case there that, yes, maybe for this individual athlete, their current fat intake is too high for the reason that it is causing their carbohydrate intake to be too low. So if they were to reduce their fat slightly, increase their carbs a bit more, get better quality training sessions, therefore they can do more training volume, mm -hmm. now they're probably going to affect their end result at the end of a training block or, or particularly in the long term. So we could definitely talk about situations like that. Um, but purely from if you match all variables, then slight changes up and down of fat intake probably aren't going to make dramatic uh, changes to uh, body fat stored. Uh, so I hope okay. something in there answered the question. No, no, that makes complete sense. And um, so, so kind of having that pyramid established, do you think there are any kind of preset diets? I don't want to say fad diets, but like um, intermittent fasting, uh, keto diets, vegan, paleo, any, any of those that, that adhere to this pyramid and, and do a great job of kind of, kind of upholding the principles, um, and not, you know, getting too far away and getting too, too kind of, um, too away from those foundational principles. Yeah. So this is a really interesting question. This is one of my favorite things to talk about because, as so often people are kind of wondering about these kind of head to head comparisons of different diets which ones are the best to do? Should I be doing this? What is the kind of pros and cons of each? And I think if we start talking about uh, these kind of hierarchies of the importance of these different factors in relation to nutrition, and we understand those factors really, like you said, we have now a set of principles to follow, that if you have these things in check, you're going to make progress. Mm -hmm. So the big thing I say to people when we're asking about specific types of diets is that all these different types of diets are just different methods. These different methods work for the same reasons. So if you have a diet that is causing you to lose body fat over time, it is because it's a diet that's putting you in a caloric deficit for an extended period of time. It Probably by a different mechanism, but it's causing you to be in a caloric deficit. So for example, you could take someone who's tracking macronutrients. They track their macros and they hit a certain amount of calories to make sure they're low enough to be in a deficit. Therefore, they're gonna lose body fat. Someone else goes on a low-carb diet, doesn't track macros. They go on a low-carb diet, they end up reducing how much carbohydrates they eat. They also aren't going to be eating any of the typical junk foods that tend to have high amount of carbs because of that. Generally, when people go on a low-carb diet, their protein intake also increases. We know when people's protein intake increases because it's fat on satiety, for example, they're probably going to eat less. That in combination with not eating as much junk food, now they're probably eating less calories than they were before. They're now in a calorie deficit and they're losing body fat. Intermittent fasting. If someone starts losing body fat by because they're doing an intermittent fasting diet, it's because the reduced meal frequency or that small, smaller condensed window of eating they now have meat means on an average each day they're consuming less calories. So all these different diets that you look at can have this end goal of, in this example that we talked about, of losing body fat. They're all doing it via the same method. In, or uh, the same principle rather, in that they are causing you to lose body fat because you're in a caloric deficit. You're just using different methods. So when people are looking at all these different options for uh, dietary approaches or different types of diets or just like general tricks that you can use or, or different strategies I suppose you can use, it depends on if that is appealing to that person, if they think it's something they'll find enjoyable, if it's something they're actually gonna stick to, and it allows them to hit those principles we said. So if any of these methods cause makes it too hard for someone to eat the right amount of calories, it's probably not a good strategy for them. If it's something that's 
going to mean that they hate it so much that they're not going to stick to this type of dieting strategy for more than a week. It's not going to be for them. If it's something that's going to affect their training performance and they're an actual athlete, then it's not for them. So it's looking at these different methods, which one you might like and which one allows you to do the things that you need to do. So again, from a perspective of a strength athlete that's going to be in the gym and has a priority on lifting weights and getting stronger and maintaining a decent body composition, which strategy can you put in place that allows you to eat a suitable amount of calories for your goal, enough protein to recover from your training sessions and or build muscle from your, your training blocks, get the right amount of carbohydrates to fuel the type of training you're doing and make sure your dietary fat intake isn't too low. And then in general, that of the foods you're consuming, you're getting enough micronutrition because on average, most of the food is good quality or whole foods or real foods or, or whatever. So if it allows you to hit all those things, then whichever strategy you want is kind of <laughs> good, right? If it, if, it, if it doesn't, then it's up to you. And, and we could talk all day about different individuals, how each strategy might work differently for them. So you could have someone intermittent fasting, someone that wants to go on a fat loss diet, they're not really bothered having breakfast, it doesn't really interest them at all, but they really enjoy having a, a large meal later in the evening after they come back from training. For them, intermittent fasting on a kind of 16-hour uh, fasting window and an 8-hour feeding window could be really useful for them because they just skip breakfast, they have their meal later on before they go and train, train, have a large meal afterwards, and it means that by the day's end, they're probably going to consume less calories just because they've completely skipped out a meal. Now, you could have another person who just feels really good and really enjoys getting up and having a breakfast, setting them up for the day, and for them doing that same meal timing would be a terrible idea. So it's the same thing. Which one allows you to stick to the things that's going to do all those principles right? Um, and so that's why I, I, I try and talk with this, this concept of principles over methods. If you can understand these principles of nutrition that affect your results, then whatever way you want to do that is completely cool. Understand the principles and you really don't have to worry about arguments that people get into over these different methods. That just kind of evaporates. Yeah, that's that's really insightful, and it almost touches on something I wanted to get into right now. Um, as far as so, we we've laid down the nutritional hierarchy. We've we've kind of looked at um, some some preset diets and how they they figure into this. So, if we have somebody that is starting a diet and does want to adjust their body composition, what are some ways we can maximize adherence? Obviously, it's it's finding what works for them, which you just kind of alluded to. Um, and I know there, there, there are certain things about kind of decreasing hunger, uh, maximizing food intake. So what sort of recommendations would you make to somebody starting a diet to help them succeed, say, over a 12, 15, 20-week span? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the big advantages to understanding these principles over having to stick to a specific dietary method is that it gets rid of a lot of the unnecessary restrictions that these different diets can place. So... For example, if someone believes they need to go on a gluten-free diet to lose weight, it's restricting a lot of types of foods that that person might not need to restrict. Similarly, with a low-carb diet, you're getting rid of a lot of carbohydrate-rich foods that you might not need to restrict if you understood these principles. Uh, you could go through the whole uh, every type of other diet, uh, a vegetarian or vegan diet. If someone doesn't mind eating meat, you're kind of restricting a nutrient for, for no reason or a type of food group for no reason. Um, you could... You can list this for everything else. So once you understand these principles, you can now start to think of a more, I suppose, flexible approach to your your dietary choices and understanding the importance of the bigger picture and what you do on average, particularly over not even over the course of a day, probably over the course of a week or longer. So, uh, so many people that when they're on a diet, particularly if it has a very strict set of rules of foods you can eat and these foods you cannot eat. The problem with that is, number one, it's very hard, so it decreases your chance of sticking to it. Number two is that when people make a mistake or they, they break from their diet or they have something they thought they're not supposed to have, it can feel like they've failed at something and they've ruined their diet for the day. So there's no point in continuing doing all the good stuff for the rest of the day. They may as well just go and eat whatever, right? They've, they've ruined their diet today. They'll get back on it tomorrow. And, and you see this all the time. People break a diet. They go crazy for the rest of the day and I'll get back on my diet tomorrow morning. Or I'll get back on it next Monday. It's a, it's a kind of classic thing people have seen all the time. Whereas if you have an understanding of these overall principles and you say, 
hey, I hadn't been planning to eat this half tub of ice cream, but I know that on average over the course of the week, it's going to come down to my overall caloric intake. So what I'm going to make sure I do is on average over this week, my protein intake each day is going to be good. I've had more calories than I was planning today because I had this unplanned thing, but I can account for those calories by either just slightly reducing on a different day or changing my meal choice later in the day. So now it's no longer a big deal. So you can fit in things like this. You have a much more flexible approach and you can have days that are high calorie days because you're going to account for them somewhere else. So I think that's the big thing that increases adherence is understanding those principles, having essentially a flexible mindset to it of looking at things, uh, particularly if you're looking, considering overall caloric intake, you can look at this on at the end of a week, what was your daily average? And so this can fluctuate up and down every day. You don't need to eat exactly 2,500 calories every single day and anything above or below that is wrong, right? You can have a rough average that by the end of the week, I want my calories to roughly be 2,500 calories per day. Now, every single day during that week, they might have been a bit different, but they're going to be averaging out to that point. So now you can allow for certain different occasions. You can have certain different meals. If you had something that you didn't plan or that wasn't typically supposed to be on your current uh, plan, then you can just uh, account for that. It's no big deal. I'll continue doing the set of principles I follow and I'll get on with it. So uh, a flexible mindset for sure is going to increase adherence um, and not having unnecessary restrictions will increase adherence. And then the rest comes down to kind of just general food preferences. Uh, so this kind of ties back to our kind of last question of if someone particularly likes uh, having um, say their their favorite breakfast and they've started trying to eat healthier and now they start eating a breakfast where they have some oatmeal and chopped banana and they think they're doing great. Now some guru comes along and says, oh no, no, to lose weight you need to be on a low carb diet. So now they can't have this breakfast that actually has some healthy foods that they feel good on, they feel full and satiated, but now someone's telling them they can't have it. Now by sticking to this low carb diet, that might decrease that person's adherence because it's changed something against their food preferences. On the flip side, for a different individual, going on a low carb diet might be great for their adherence because the types of foods they enjoy is in the morning they like having a breakfast of some eggs and some pieces of, of bacon and some cheese. And then throughout the day, they like snacking on nuts and maybe a protein bar or something. So the amount of carbohydrate they generally eat isn't that high anyway. And it's one way that if they say, okay, I'm on a low carb diet, they can eat foods they enjoy and then they can almost just forget about all the other stuff they might easily overeat on, and then it allows them to stick to it easier. So it really depends on, like I said, food preferences, uh, but most of all, having that flexible mindset and not viewing it as, I, I can't make this one mistake or my whole diet is broken. That these are all small little choices. What you do on average is what counts, and consistently good habits with some sort of flexibility built in is, is going to be really the key to driving long-term adherence as opposed to super restrictive rules, I think. Right. And uh, so if you are successful in, in, in dieting and losing whatever amount of body fat, um, what would you say is is key or, or very important to keep in mind when trying to keep that weight off after a diet? Um, is it still kind of following the same, same principles that you use during the diet or is there is there some way you can kind of decrease the restriction um, because it, it, it is very tough to keep that weight off. So um, just whatever insight you'd like to share about that. Sure. Yeah. I, and this really is probably one of the, the, the big issues right now within nutrition in, in that we know that people's biggest problems is long-term weight loss maintenance. So it's not even losing weight initially because because we know pretty much everyone that has gone on some form of diet, no matter how crazy or what type of fad diet it was, most people lost weight on it, at least initially. Uh, the problem is that they couldn't sustain it, that it wasn't a sustainable way of eating. And most people will either gain that weight back or even gain more than they, or higher than they were currently at or previously at. So we know that maintaining lost uh, body weight is a real problem. So some things that I think might be useful for people is one, the more kind of uh, long-term sustainable view they've probably taken uh, is probably going to help them in the long run once they get to a more of a maintenance phase. Uh, tying into that, I would say, once they've kind of came to a point where they've got their body uh, fat levels down, transitioning to a phase where they're still keeping most of the 
habits that they've done to get down to that lower weight, but just slightly increasing their calories. So not saying, okay, I've got down to my weight now, I'll just go back to eating whatever I kind of feel or kind of uh, having no kind of constraint whatsoever. Trying to keep in some of those constraints, but just bringing food intake back up, even doing that for a few weeks is probably going to offset a lot of the at least physiological things that happen when we diet. So when we diet and under eat in combination with losing body fat, we're going to change a whole lot of different hormones. So the amounts of leptin and ghrelin and all these different gut hormones that we have that are driving our, our feelings of hunger and how active we're likely to be, they can all change when we're in a dieting phase. So coming off the back of a diet, particularly if someone's lost a decent amount of weight, can be a pretty challenging time. And so just kind of freewheeling it might be an issue for a lot of people. So even for a few weeks, if they were to still kind of monitor what they're consuming, just gradually bring food intake back up to more of what we'd estimate a a maintenance level of calories at and see for the next kind of three, four weeks, can they kind of maintain this new low body weight? Uh, And I think that kind of uh, kind of block of a maintenance phase can be even used throughout the dieting period itself, particularly for people who have lots of body fat to lose. So for someone who has lots of, of body weight to lose and, and get down, it can be quite daunting to think that they're going to be dieting continuously with no end date set because we don't know when they're going to get it there or they're going to be doing it for months on end. It, it's going to be very difficult to do that. And even if they do, it's going to be very difficult for that maintenance block afterwards. So what we can look at is smaller blocks of time of dieting down, getting down X amount of pounds. And then from there, trying to hold that new low body weight for a number of weeks before going through the next block of dieting. So that can be really useful. Um, So I think those and then just having generally a plan for when the diet is finished is probably a good idea. Uh, Trying to keep similar types of foods and meals that you've currently been using towards the tail end of the diet in your diet but just maybe increasing portion sizes, doing that for a few weeks, trying not to have any kind of large, crazy cheat meals or blow up meals or kind of celebration meals now that you've finished the diet, Um, at least for a couple of weeks until you can kind of moderate your your decision making, I think a bit better around food. So a couple of weeks of still sticking the same stuff, but a bit more food might be make sense. And um, they'd be kind of the main things to do. I think the, the biggest thing that all of those tactics are going to do is just create an awareness of what you're consuming. So just because the diet is over, have some sort of tool that can keep an awareness. So if it's not tracking calories, it could be something like just keeping a food diary so that you can actually see at the end of the day, oh, I'm actually snacking like four or five times I thought it was only like having two snacks a day. Just some sort of an awareness tool. Um, looking at your portion sizes, just being aware of that stuff. How often are you going out for for meals? What type of foods are going to be uh, very high in calories that you might want to limit portion sizes at least for a few weeks? So anything that creates an awareness of what you're consuming is probably going to be the way to go as opposed to just saying, okay, I'm off the diet now, so I'll just eat whatever. Okay. That's, that's, that's very, um, that's very informative. And and as far as um, the kind of the diet breaks or, or maintenance periods, um, how often would you kind of um, position those in, in a diet? So maybe every 12 weeks, every 16 weeks. Um, like what's, your, what's your kind of general recommendation there? So uh, the, the factors that would de- determine the length of those breaks would probably be number one, how much weight someone has to lose overall. Also, how long is the full dieting uh, period going to be until they reach, say, their end goal weight? Uh, so the longer that is means are going to have more of those breaks throughout. Um, the second thing you would determine is the rate of fat loss that person is going for. So we don't talk about this, but there, there, you can have a typical slower sustainable rate of fat loss where you're not under eating by as much. You're in a slight calorie deficit and you're maybe losing, let's say, a pound per week, something in, in that range. And you're doing that consistently over a longer period of time. Some people may choose to do a more aggressive type of diet where they lose at a faster rate through using a larger calorie deficit. So they're eating less calories and they're losing uh, weight quicker over that period of time. So what that means is that while they're going faster and having to eat less, which is tough, it will decrease the overall length of the diet to get to that end goal because they're just happening faster. So those two things, again, will dictate how often you might need to refeed. Uh, and just how fast someone should go will probably depend on a whole host of things, how lean they currently are, are they an athlete, 
Are they currently in season or out of season? All these different factors. But so the, the rate of weight loss will determine how often you do it. And then again, personally, how long someone can kind of tolerate before they start to get to the point of where it's getting really tough. And so you want to try and cut it off at the point where things are getting uh, quite tough uh, in terms of the diet. Uh, and before they get to kind of some sort of breaking point. So some people can tolerate longer periods of diets um, w- without having one of these breaks. Um, but I mean, as a general rule, you could have someone that's, let's say that's losing that pound a week and they're going to be dieting for uh, 16 weeks total. Maybe every uh, by every fifth week, you're going to have a kind of one week diet break that could be one example of a way to set it up. You have three of them throughout the phase. You could have halfway through, you have a three week period where you, you take a break and you try and maintain. It could be a whole host of different things. It, you, you have, um, if you look at the way different coaches set stuff up, some of them will do like just a weekend refeed rather than a full diet break. They might do that every two or three weeks. So there's, there's no real rules on ways you must do it. It's more what will be most appealing to the client. What are they going to be implement? What is going to stop them feeling that it's as difficult? And the biggest thing is just to give a kind of these shorter milestones. So it's not looking like, okay, you're going to be dieting for the next six months continuously. It's like, okay, our next block is for the next uh, five weeks. We're going to diet. Then from there, we're going to go through a two-week or three-week maintenance block where we're going to maintain that new lower weight and focus on some other things. And then we're going to start into another block then afterwards. So now they have a clear end point of, okay, this dieting isn't so great. It kind of sucks. I'm eating less food. I have to be a bit more careful. I have to monitor stuff. Training isn't as great. But I know that it's going to be done in three or four weeks' time. So uh, I think that's the biggest thing, having some sort of shorter time period to focus on and knowing that it's not just this continuous thing with actual no end date in sight, because that could be hard to, for people to keep up with. Yeah, I've never really thought of it like that. And the, the way you kind of phrased it, it almost makes it seem like training where you have like three to three to five week um, training block, and then you have like a deload. Um, and you always look forward to the deload towards the end of the training block. So that's, that's really interesting. And, and it's definitely something right. I'm going to kind of keep in mind. Yeah, I think it works really well with strength athletes from that perspective because they understand the idea of like periodization over a period of time. They they their mind thinks in blocks of time like that where they're focusing on different things. And I mean to a certain degree, you can even start to try and uh, put in some of their dietary stuff periodized with their kind of training programming. So if they're well away from a meet and they're now going into a more higher volume uh, kind of hypertrophy based uh, training block now might be a good time to actually put them in a kind of slight deficit because they're going to be doing those higher training volumes, but they're also, the intensity won't be as high, so it won't be beating them up as much. Uh, but two, it also will give a really good stimulus to hold on to some of that muscle mass, which can be a problem during dieting blocks. But now because of the high volume, they might be able to hold on to it more. So you could periodize it with that, and then you can start to put blocks of where they're maybe going to focus on some higher intensity stuff with more of a maintenance or a surplus. Um, and you, you can start playing around with that stuff, but even outside of matching it to training, you could just get them to think of it in that mindset of different blocks of time, periodize in this different manner. Uh, essentially, you, you could refer to these maintenance periods, you could refer to them as essentially nutritional deloads, right? You've been putting yeah. this stress on your body by under eating for this period of time. We've now got a certain effect, but now we need to deload to resensitize you to stuff and then you'll be able to go into next dieting block fresher which will happen mentally they'll be fresher you can hit that next dieting block harder and which makes sense right you go through a six week dieting block two weeks off and another six weeks Mm -hmm. when you're in that second six week block if you hadn't had that two weeks off mentally you're going to be a lot more drained it might be more difficult to make good decisions on a day-to-day basis versus having those two weeks off so that could be one great strategy i think for a lot of strength athletes terming it in those things of looking at these as different blocks thinking of maintenance not as just time off your diet or not doing anything, think of it as a deload, right? It's not not coming to training. You still have very specific stuff to do, but we're just going to change your volume and intensity. In this case, we're going to change your calories and macronutrients. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree for sure. That's really interesting because the, just framing it like that, it, it still maintains more – or maintain, it still maintains more of a purpose, uh, whereas like maintenance, it just seems like you're not really achieving anything at all. So, um, right. 
I, I don't know why the meathead in me just like got really excited when you kind of started saying that. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. And that's the problem a lot of time with these kind of maintenance blocks that people can kind of get disillusioned because it feels like, or, or wait, especially when you use the term diet break, it's like, okay, I'm not doing anything right now. Like, so they don't pay any attention. Whereas that's not the idea. You should pretty much be doing everything you were doing before, but just eating more calories. So terming it as uh, a deload or a resensitization block or uh, some sort of kind of refeed might be more useful than some of these other terms uh, for that reason. Sure. And that, that kind of goes against um, the idea, the preset idea I had in my mind about a refeed where like typically what it would have been is uh, you would maybe have one day throughout the week. Um, so, so kind of breaking up into these, these larger but yet smaller chunks every three to five weeks or something is really fascinating. Um, now in terms of like uh, a body recomposition, do you think that is actually feasible to an extent that's um, useful to even try or is it just something that's like theoretically a good idea but doesn't really pan out? Yeah, so the, there's two ways to approach this. I think definitely, without a doubt, for, for people who think that it's impossible to lose body fat and gain muscle at the same time, that's just completely incorrect. I mean, there's there's so many studies that even that they even if they weren't looking to uh, look for that stuff, they were looking at other outcomes. You can see lots of resistance training studies where they had people who typically are more kind of novices and and at higher body fat levels, but not always. But you can have some of these people go through a training block. And if you look at their body composition measures at the start and the end, a lot of them will have gained some lean body mass and will have lost fat mass. So this happens pretty consistently in a lot of cases in science. We have data showing this. So people can definitely do so. Uh, however, that said, it it's probably should be made the point that it's probably more likely to happen in certain cases, mm -hmm. some that I've just mentioned. So if someone is new to resistance training, we, everyone kind of sees this phenomenon if, if no one's ever lifted before and they start doing some training you can basically look at a barbell and gain some muscle mass right regardless of what you do and so that person could still be in a deficit maybe losing some body fat but they're still going to be gaining muscle at the same time so someone new to resistance training is definitely in a good position to do go through recomposition uh, secondly those people with higher levels of body fat probably tend to find that a bit easier too uh, purely because they are at a lower risk of losing muscle mass through a, a harsh deficit and even if the deficit is slight they have this extra body fat store that they're liberating and maybe can use some of that to go towards building some muscle so it tends to happen more readily in those um you can then the third would probably be people who have are coming back from an injury layoff or who have gone through a period of detraining so whether they had an injury and couldn't train or just stop training for a few months uh, you see pretty reliably that they can make pretty substantial gains in muscle mass back to kind of their previous level of muscle mass, even in a deficit where they may be leaning out. Uh, so there was actually some some uh, a study that got a lot of press last year where people were in a, like a 40% calorie deficit and gained muscle during uh, the trial. That was a very high protein trial. But one of the kind of caveats to that was these were a group of, I think, college athletes who were football players who were coming back from an off season. So a lot of these guys just hadn't bothered doing much training during the off season. Now they're getting back to the gym. They're putting this high protein trial. They're starting to lift some weights again. And so some of that muscle mass they lost during detraining comes back very quickly. And you're going to regain that a lot quicker than building new muscle. So someone that's coming from a detraining scenario, again, is in a good position for recomposition. And then obviously, if someone is using like anabolic steroids or something, then recomposition is going to happen pretty reliably. But if we're talking about kind of uh, natural athletes and strength athletes who have maybe been training for a considerable period of time, are at a decent level of body composition, have a decent amount of training experience behind them, uh, like we say, are, are not enhanced athletes, then it's going to be harder for those to have some sort of recomposition. Uh, I still think it's uh, possible and I think it definitely can happen. Uh, the downsides or the cons that you could say for this strategy, number one would be that you probably have to pay a bit more attention to detail in that you have to make sure that not only is the training stimulus right and that you're very clear on your protein and your timing for all this stuff, but you're at the calorie deficit you use is going to be, have to be very slight or even close to maintenance uh, for this to happen. Uh, the second thing that you could maybe make a case for is, is it an optimal strategy? So even if it could happen over, let's say, a period of 
six months, you stay close to maintenance, maybe slight deficit at times. And during that period of time, you do gain some muscle and lose some body fat. Over that six month period, is that going to lead to the same body composition or a better body composition than if you had given, let's say, four full months to a proper gaining phase of giving yourself a, a calorie surplus where you're going to be in the best environment to gain as much muscle as possible over that four month period, get all those gains you can, and then some of the body fat you may have gained during that time, you then take the next two months to diet down and get lean again. So at the end of that six month period, what would be the difference? Uh, uh, of course, it's hard to speculate on any one individual case. Um, uh, I think there's a decent case to be made for a lot of people to breaking it up into distinct phases. I think, in uh, again, that could be based on that idea that probably you might get some uh, benefits uh, purely on a, if you're looking at measurements. But even if we don't have that data, I would think, going back to kind of our last question, from a psychological perspective, a lot of these athletes are going to want to have focus of a specific block, right? So if you have a block now where you're focused on hypertrophy and gaining as much muscle as you can, knowing that you're going into those training sessions in a calorie surplus every day, that you're eating more food overall, that you're really recovering from these training sessions, you're feeling great, you can come in and you're able to make tremendous progress in the gym because of all this extra food, that can really drive more training progress during that block. And then for that a dieting block where you have to kind of keep calories more in check, you can focus more on that because you know you're specifically dieting rather than for the next six months. Let's not overeat really. Let's not under eat too much, but I want you to keep around these calories. You're still having to keep some sort of control over it. So I think purely from a psychological perspective, that's something worth considering. Uh, now that said, I think for sure a lot of people can do, uh, could do that. Uh, and what you'll probably see in a lot of cases is that as a more of a long-term strategy for, I think, people who are more at an advanced level, who are maybe close to their kind of uh, potential, but have maybe are, have settled fairly well into a specific weight class. So if you take a high-level power lifter or weight lifter who has a really clear weight class that they're sticking to, and their main goal over, let's say, a few years uh, of a time window is performance. So they're eating enough to recover, from their training sessions, eating enough to fuel their uh, next session, making sure they're doing all the dietary stuff right, they're making sure they're not losing any weight because they don't want to go down and lose muscle, and they're not uh, just completely going crazy on their diet because they have to stay within their weight class. You could probably uh, make a fair case that over that kind of couple of year window, if someone's doing all that stuff and they're continuing to get stronger and still, still do all this stuff right and recover, if you were to maybe look at a couple of DEXA scans over that period of time, they probably would have gained some muscle mass, right? So now that they're still in the same weight class, they've probably lost mo uh, body fat over that period as well. So I think it definitely does go on. And uh, I, I just think it depends on what someone's goal is and how much muscle mass they're likely to gain in a certain period, what kind of their main goal is, whether it's it's actually body composition or in a strength sport. Um, so it in, in short, <laughs> to round it all up, it, it does happen. It's more likely in certain cases. For certain people, it might be a better idea to go through distinct phases of gaining and dieting. But if not, people can certainly go through more kind of extended periods of, of recomposition for sure. So um, what would you say is an acceptable amount of weight gain if, if you do want to initiate a, a massing phase and then diet down? Um, kind of, where would you draw the limit? Um, and maybe even more so for weight class athletes, do you think like if you're gaining, you should move up? Do you think like there's... Um, there, there, there's like a certain recommendation there. Cool. So uh, there's probably two questions I can take them separately. Yeah. That, that first one is general rates of weight gain for a muscle mass phase. Uh, so again, like the last one, the kind of things that will dictate this is probably someone's level of, of how new they are to training and the current body composition. If they're really new to training, as long as they're just lifting weights and eating correctly, then however quick they're going to gain that muscle, great, just let that come. For probably most people listening to this that have been lifting for a while that uh, are kind of relatively decent body composition right now that just want to put on some more muscle, you're probably looking at the, the rates of muscle mass being uh, a bit slower than a lot of people would like and maybe sometimes not all that exciting to see. And so for a, a lot of people, um, you might want to look at where, whereas we talked about for um, body weight, for example, uh, you could probably look at 
uh, a pound loss per week is seeing something as slow as sustainable. For gaining muscle mass, you're probably not going to be looking at something like a pound per week. It's probably going to be something in the region of, I guess, uh, a pound every couple of weeks. Uh, and for more advanced people, it could be even further than that. So a, a nice average, I would say, for maybe, let, let's take a general intermediate lifter has been has a decent few years of, of training behind them relatively decent body composition and just wants to gain some mass over time and they're going through a gaining phase for the next let's say four or five months because you want to give it a decent amount of time if they were to say okay on average i want to gain maybe two to three pounds per month of body weight i think that's pretty decent uh, in that over that next five months you're probably looking at what somewhere or between 12 to 15 pounds of body weight. Uh, some of that, of course, will be body fat, but you can dry that off fairly quickly because it's most of that will still have, have been muscle, hopefully. Uh, and so that's pretty significant amount of weight in that period of time. So I would say probably yeah, uh, two pounds per month is probably a decent uh, start point for for a lot of guys. But again, it, it can be quite individual, and obviously depends on your current body size. If you're comparing a 66 kilo lifter versus a 105 kilo lifter. Then uh, there, the differences in in body weight gain are going to be different. So you can probably look at it proportionally. So you might say, um, I don't know, something like uh, one percent of your body weight per month or something like that uh, might be a good way to go. Um, so yeah, I, I'd look at it for that for in terms of weight gain. Um, the the second question is kind of a bit more nuanced and takes a bit of time to get through of uh, determining best weight classes in the long term for someone. And should they eat up to the next weight class? Should they kind of cut down? Should they stay in the current one? Uh, and like the previous questions, it kind of depends on current context and where they are in their lifting career. I think a, a good general rule of thumb that Greg Knuckles often talks about is for uh, power lifters, and you, you can make the same case for weight lifters, is that generally you want to be uh, whatever the highest weight class you can get into while staying relatively lean is probably going to be your most competitive weight class in the long term. So maybe not right now and the first time you transition to that weight class, but definitely in the long term. Uh, and you see this quite reliably that uh, particularly in, in powerlifting, you're going to see uh, if you have two guys that are the same weight class and you have one guy that's really tall and one guy that's really short, you're kind of going to be pretty sure that the shorter guy, if they're both relatively lean for that weight class, is probably on average going to be... Um, and again, it's, it's quite a broad generalization, but on average is probably going to be uh, a more competitive lifter purely because they're going to have more muscle mass to be at that body weight. And so a taller, bigger person uh, is going to obviously not going to have as muscle mass to stay at the same uh, weight class. So in general, if someone is kind of new and they're just beginning their lifting career and they've got a lot of potential to gain lots of muscle mass, they probably want to try and gain as much as they can over the next few years, get as much muscle mass as they can possibly build whilst not getting like super fat or anything. So again, that term relatively lean depends on the person. Um, whatever someone wants to give a cutoff point, it might be 15% on average, let's say for the kind of middle weight classes. Uh, and you could maybe go up and down a few percentage points given on the person, but whatever you kind of feel strong at, that's still relatively lean. Um, staying getting to the highest weight class you can you're probably going to be most uh, productive uh, and as so i would say for particularly younger lifters or, or newer lifters who maybe have a ton of potential to build more muscle they're they should really be focusing on gaining phases and going up through the weight classes as they can don't worry about being like super competitive in their next meet or so unless they're like going for compete like uh, junior worlds or something or world youth championships or something like that um but apart from that, just stay gaining at a nice steady rate, stay getting stronger, fill out those weight classes, move up as you need, and kind of get to, to what you can without getting uh, extremely uh, overweight. And then uh, from there, for people who are more kind of closer to the advanced level or maybe closer to or, or can't gain huge amounts of muscle fairly quickly, you're going to determine on just what you can be most competitive at. And so the be going beyond what we said about trying to get into the highest weight class, if you're kind of stuck between two, uh, you could make the call of how close you are to the one below you. Is that a very easy, doable water cut that you can do and still perform pretty well? Or to get down to that weight, is your strength going to suffer so much that you're actually going to be a less competitive lifter? And so 
with this, you can you can start tracking your numbers, either training numbers or estimated one rep maxes, and doing that in conjunction with taking your body weights and getting an idea of your relative strength rather than your absolute strength. So for a powerlifter, look at your wilt score over time with your body weight. Is it going up? Or even if you're dieting and you're now goes the weight class down, but your weight wilt has got worse, you're now less competitive. Uh, similar, a weightlifter could do the same with their Sinclair score. So uh, I think comparing it to these changes and are you becoming more competitive or less competitive, um, and that would be kind of more for the people that are at a more advanced level or who have maybe are further along how much muscle they can actually build. But if you're a long, younger lifter or a more novice lifter who can gain lots more muscle, just continue gaining with that and don't worry about weight classes right now is, I think, a generally good rule of thumb. Um, and then for everyone else, it's basically – what weight class can you stay relatively lean that you can make the weight without too much stress on your body that's going to affect your lifts too much and that you're going to be most competitive at? Um, and again, we could get into so much more like, little details on that, but I think that's a general way for people to start thinking through that through that question. Sure. And as far as a, like a water cut, um, like I've always been under the impression that you should only lose a certain percentage of your body weight before it impacts your performance. But yet I'll see MMA guys cut like 15, 20 pounds. And I even know some powerlifters that have cut like around 15 pounds for a meet. Um, how, how, how concrete do you think those recommendations are? And do you think there's a lot of flexibility in there in terms of how much weight you can actually lose and still perform? Yeah. So, uh, a couple of things to mention first is, uh, the first thing, obviously, to consider that's going to be the main determinant here is the, the federation the person's lifting in, and so what time frame they have between the weigh-in and the actual meet. So some of those powerlifters you mentioned, if they are doing a, a day before weigh-in and they have 24 hours, you can still cut those large amounts of weights we see in boxing and MMA, and you have loads of time to rehydrate and refuel. Uh, if we're talking about someone that's in like the USAPL or some other IPF affiliate where they may have two hours at most between their weigh-in and and start squatting, uh, they don't have a large window to be able to rehydrate uh, that much and to refuel. And so because of that, you can only rehydrate your body at a certain rate and you can only restore glycogen at a certain rate. And so therefore, you can only cut a certain amount of weight via those methods of dehydration and carbohydrate restriction before your performance starts to decrease. And so I think the the thing to, for people to bear in mind with weight cutting is it's not the question of ask of how much weight can I cut because I can get you to cut a shit ton of weight, right? But it doesn't mean it's going to be good for your performance. And when we look at what would most likely contribute to good performance from a nutritional standpoint of view for lifting, if there was no weight class and we said to you, you're going to lift next Saturday, I want you to be as prepared as you can. That person's going to go out and make sure that they're fully hydrated. They're going to have lots of food in their system. They're going to have full stores of carbohydrate and they're feeling ready to go. With a weight cut, you're essentially doing the opposite. You're going to be taking in less fluid. You're going to restrict that. You're going to be slightly dehydrated. You're going to be under eating for a few days. You're going to be having less amount of carbohydrates stored in your muscle. So things that go against performance. And so the kind of trade-off here is at what point can you, uh, if that allows you to maybe get down to a, a lower weight class that you might be more competitive in, but doesn't impact performance enough for it to be a bad decision. And so that line can be individual and some people can tolerate more weight uh, loss than others but in general if we're talking to a large group of people i think there's some pretty decent ranges we can give that would give a, give a good idea so for a weight cut if someone hasn't really done it before for something like a two-hour weight cut for powerlifting i would probably say if it's the first time someone's done it and they really want to give it a shot then i would try and say get your normal walk around weight to maybe two percent 3% at the most above your kind of weight class and see can you do a 2 to 3% uh, weight cut the week of the meet and still perform well uh, because I think that is pretty doable if it's done correctly and we can talk about some of those strategies in a moment but if it's done correctly 2 to 3% of your body weight loss is pretty doable and still able to perform pretty well I think in a powerlifting meet or a weightlifting meet um, so trial that and then if it's super easy and you for some reason want to maybe gain more muscle in the future and still cut back down, maybe you try a bit more the next few times. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't, go, especially if it's an important priority meet, I wouldn't start cutting weight for the first time in huge amounts of it to cut. And particularly if you're newer to lifting and you know you're not going to place anywhere near the podium or you're not doing it to win something, it's just not worth it, right? Mm -hmm. If you like, just don't bother, just 
go in the next weight class up, hit PRs on all your lifts and move on. Um, but so from that perspective, I think two to three percent is pretty doable. With that said, um, that can be as high as four, maybe even five percent, I think, for some people. But there are more kind of outliers. I think maybe four percent is probably very doable for a lot of people as well. But when we're talking about losing two, three, four percent of your body weight in the days leading up to a meet, that is very different to what I think a lot of people do, which is dehydrating themselves by two, three, four percent. So they're purely just sweating this water out or not drinking water or just water loading and, and restricting and only doing it via water losses. Whereas I think there's lots of other strategies that we can talk about that can allow you to drop body weight very acutely in a couple of days that aren't going to be related to dehydration. So for example, one is going through a low fiber or something called a low residue diet, even for two to three days before your meat, basically taking out foods that are high in fiber that can reliably reduce the amount of residue that stays around in your intestine. And so just doing that for two to three days in a lot of cases, particularly for people who are eating a healthy diet with plenty of fiber in it, can lose up to about 1%, maybe 1.5% of your body weight via that method alone. And that method has zero impact on your performance. So now you've already taken off that 1% straight away. So now the amount you need to lose via sweat or via water restriction is already reduced. The next thing you can do is lower your carbohydrate intake for the week leading up to the meet. So while carbohydrates can be very important during training blocks and for particularly for high volume training, you don't need to be have full stores of glycogen on meat day probably to perform well. And so reducing down your carbohydrate levels in the week leading up to the meet means you're going to lose some glycogen from your muscle stores. You're also going to lose some of the water that's uh, associated with that glycogen. And so your weight will drop another bit again. So now you've lost some of that. So now your body weight is already down a decent amount before you've ever done anything with water manipulation. And now for maybe that final percent or so, you can do some water loading for a few days. The day before your meet, you restrict your water intake to quite a low amount, and then you lose some water weight, and then you go in and weigh in the next morning. And there you can get a pretty easy 3 4% body weight drop in that week via these methods without a drastic amount of dehydration or anything close to dangerous. And then once you have a sound rehydration protocol after you weigh in, you can probably go and compete fairly well. Um, That said, some people respond differently. So like I said, some people can cut more than others and still feel good and perform good. The other aspect to consider is psychologically how it affects people. Uh, I know lifters and high level lifters who are far uh, better at lifting than I am who hate the idea of doing uh, a weight cut and will happily sit a couple of kilos below their current weight class and compete there because they have nothing to worry about the week of the meat. They don't have to play around with water or their food. They can eat all they want. They can get up the morning of the meat, have a nice large breakfast, feel ready to go, treat it the same way as they go into a training session, have zero stress, and they can feel good. And they prefer that to having any stress around a weight cut. So there's definitely the psychological component to take into account. And uh, like I said, uh, cutting the most weight you possibly can is probably not a good way to think. It's what can what amount of a weight cut is suitable for me to be able to lift my best and be my most competitive? And so I would say to people, if you have never done it before and you're thinking of doing it, start with a target of a small enough weight cut. So let's say 2% of your body weight. Let's see if you can do that weight cut. And maybe pick a mock meet in your gym or maybe pick a, a testing day that you're going to do that's not actually a meet and do the same things you do leading up to a meet and then trial this weight cut, see how you feel, see what your lifts do in comparison to what you would have estimated the map based on your training. And you can make some decisions then of if it's for you and how much you can probably get away with. And then over time, it's just trial and error. Yeah, I think that's really smart. I think for a lot of things, you should always test it before a competition, um, testing out different like tapering protocols, um, different weight cut strategies. I think it's really important because like you said, it's super stressful to compete already and having to, to top that with making weight and then making sure you're, you're rested and recovered. Um, it, it can be very stressful. And I guess that's why people sure. hire, hire people like you, you know, take care of it for them and, uh, and make sure they, yeah. So even at that though, I think people could have the best plan. And that's why I say for, if it's particularly if someone's new to lifting and they're doing their first ever powerlifting meet, that is the last place you want to cut sure. weight, right? You, you have enough going on of just getting used to being on the platform the first time, all the different stuff going on. It's a very different environment to a lot of people that people are used to, even if they're around this stuff in the gym all the time. And so just go in and, and do that, particularly if it's like your first meet, um, or if it's particularly a high priority meet, and you've never cut a lot of weight before, 
again, don't leave yourself a ton to cut because you're already going to be fairly stressed about this stuff or there's a lot of pressure on a certain type of meat. At least have it done before. And if it's done before already, it's 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 going to take such a weight off your mind. It's it's like going in for uh, your – it's it's uh, akin to if you've never cut weight before and you go in and, and want to do a large weight cut for meat, it's like going in and taking your opener at a weight that you've never even gotten here in training before. There is straight away that psychological doubt. If that opener is something you've hit routinely every week for the last eight weeks as just a, a moderate single, there's going to be zero pressure when you go in and, and take it. So the same thing is going to apply here. If it's something you've done before, that reassurance in the back of your mind is, is worth its weight in gold. So that's why I think test uh, weight cuts are, are going to be uh, extremely important, particularly for people who haven't cut that much weight before. Right. And um – yeah, I guess that just kind of gets to the most important point of the podcast. It just kind of depends on the person, depends on their skill level, depends on you know their prior experiences. Um, so it's, there's a lot to take into consideration, and that's why hiring a coach is so so useful. Um, sure, kind of takes out that guesswork. Uh, so just uh, just kind of wrapping up, I just have a few questions, um, kind of outside of nutrition and lifting and and, and stuff. Um, as far as who has influenced you the most? I think it'd be really interesting to hear because then a lot of people could kind of research that person and uh, and, and kind of get some insight. Sure. Uh, there's, there's a few that spring to mind right now, and I'm, I'll probably leave out a, a few that I forget, so apologies. But there's definitely a few I'll mention. Uh, one is a, a UK-based uh, performance nutritionist called Martin McDonald, who was uh, a mentor of mine that I originally – when I mentored under back in like early 2014, uh, he taught me an awful lot, lot, mainly around just critical thinking and how to have that kind of critical thinking mindset when it came to not only nutrition, but just thinking about science and evidence and how we make decisions and how we make conclusions and, and thinking around the context and caveats around stuff and really not buying into stuff initially, no matter who says it, before asking a few questions. Uh, and Martin has had a tremendous impact on, on my career, and he has uh, thankfully became one of my really good friends, and uh, I really re- respect the stuff he puts out. So if people aren't aware of him, uh, Martin is an awesome guy to look at uh, for his nutrition information. He runs a great nutrition course for people who are looking interested in becoming a nutrition coach. Um, so he'd be one. Um, another kind of turning point for me as well was around that same time, like 2013, I think it was, I uh, attended a seminar uh, ran by Alan Aragon, who I'm sure many people will be familiar with. And again, in a very similar way, uh, he had a large impact on me. Again, it wasn't the specific things he said about diet. It was the way he communicated things and his scientific mindset. And you could see the way he evaluated, evaluated information. And that really stuck with me. And that's what him and Martin had in common is that I started to learn about how they think about things and how cr- this kind of uh, critical analysis they place on things or, or questions they ask before they make conclusions. And and so those two things uh, have definitely had profound impacts of uh, mentoring under Martin and attending Alan's uh, seminar and getting to know uh, those guys. Um, and then there's been a ton of other people since that have really influenced me in terms of uh, nutrition. I've obviously mentioned Eric Helms a, a couple of times already, um, a guy I have tremendous respect for, really, really good. Uh, like Eric so much. He's a tremendous human being as well. Um, really, really nice guy. Uh, uh, and I've had the pleasure of hanging out with him a couple of times. And really, really nice. Um, then there's people within the field uh, that are obviously doing tremendous work. Uh, Greg Knuckles is another guy that I've had the pleasure of, of hanging out with, who I'm sure if people are interested in lifting and haven't came across Greg or Stronger by Science, then that's the place to go. Go to that website right now and pretty much read every article Greg has written. It's fantastic. He's phenomenally brilliant uh, guy and is insanely strong too um so there are a few that come to mind straight away those four guys and i'm sure i could stay going on mentioning more and more but if if people are looking for a good place to start go check out martin and alan uh eric uh, and greg uh they'd be a good four to start with sure so those are some some people uh to, to use as resources but as far as um maybe books podcasts um YouTube channels, really anything. Um, what what else would you recommend? Um, that's kind of outside of the fitness industry. Mm. So maybe like philosophy. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, outside of fitness, uh, there's a few different places that I, I look for information. Um, 
general podcasts I like to listen to, uh, one would be Sam Harris's podcast. Uh, so he obviously kind of gets into a lot of um, philosophy-based stuff, uh, but also kind of touches on kind of more uh, political or kind of uh, news-based uh, issues right now, but comes out from kind of a background of neuroscience and looking at it from this kind of philosophical lens. So I like a lot of uh, Sam Harris's stuff. Um, I, I, I like listening to uh, Tim Ferriss's podcast. And I mean, a lot of different people have different opinions of, of Tim Ferriss, but I think just the collection of different people that are on that show and hearing their backgrounds, um, the types of questions Tim asks are actually pretty good in, in my opinion. And I think uh, I just like hearing from people from these various different backgrounds. Joe Rogan's podcast for the same reason, just this great mix of different people um, and just hearing their kind of breakdown and stuff. Uh, so from, from a podcast perspective, uh, they'd be definitely a few that I, I gear people towards. Um, and then, I don't know, man, outside of that, I think books, I mean, I could probably pull up a whole host of books that, that I've really in, in, enjoyed reading. Um, I think if there are to advise people, ones that I found interesting recently, uh, there's one guy, guy, I think his name is Daniel Gilbert. Uh, I could be wrong. I'll check that for you. Um, and it's a book, I'll pull up the name. Um, I think it's stumbling on happiness. Mm -hmm. I think that's the name of the book. Uh, if people like listening to podcasts and audio, you can get that as an audio book. It's phenomenally, it's, it's read by the author. It's phenomenal. Um, similarly, there's a audio book called we learn nothing by a guy called Tim Kreider, uh, phenomenal. And, uh, the recent one I listened to was uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by um, um, Mark Manson, I think, uh, is the author's name. So, again, they can be either audiobooks or physical books. They're kind of general ones I think will appeal to a lot of people regardless of what they're kind of interested in. Uh, there are a few that are coming off the top of my head, but there's probably lots that I'm missing. Sure. Sure, that's excellent. Um, and then kind of to pose the same question to you that you pose to, to all of your uh, guests that you have on your podcast. Um, what's one thing that our listeners could do each day to, to improve their lives? Mm. Yeah, this is, this is interesting because I, I tend to flip flop anytime I, I think about this question. I'm like, depends on the day. I'll, I'll probably give a different answer. Uh, and I, I don't want to kind of give the cliche kind of a gratitude thing because a lot of people on my podcast have said that, and I definitely agree with it. Um, but I, I think more than gratitude, uh, I think a better word that, that I like people to think of is uh, perspective, because um, I think in a lot of cases, it's hard to tell people to have gratitude for stuff that we're not really grateful for, or particularly if we're in a shit situation in life right now, or something particularly kind of tragic or bad has happened, just to tell someone, oh, just be grateful what you have can maybe be hard to be actionable. I think a really good way to think of it is to, to have some perspective on a lot of stuff, because most often... Uh, and of course, there's lots of crazy, tragic stuff that hits all of us in our life that is just you. We can't do anything about, and it's just going to suck and it's going to be terrible. Uh, but the most of the things we actually get agitated by, and get angry by, and get sad about, and get worked up about, most of those things, in the grand scheme of things, aren't really that big a deal. And we only realize that, like we look back on things. If you, if we were all to think back right now three years ago or four years ago, some sort of thing that got us worked up or some sort of thing we're really down about. And we look back at it now, like it just doesn't bother us that much. It's just like, it doesn't matter, right? Like life goes on, all this other stuff matters way more. And I think we can lose sight of that perspective. And on, on most cases on a day-to-day -day basis, we lose the perspective of that there's there really is very few things in our life that truly matter to the degree that we actually should really get worked up about. And so... I would say allow yourself to get worked up and anxious and angry about some of those things and get sad about that stuff. But most of the other stuff, like 90% of the stuff we do that with is just, it just doesn't matter. And we need to put it in that perspective. And so, um, there's different strategies people can do of thinking about this. I, I know, for example, one particularly dark strategy that, um, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about is he has this kind of uh, trick that I'm sure a lot of people will find quite morbid, but he's talked about where he has this uh, strategy where he envisions the worst potential scenario that would make him the most sad at this moment. And it's always the same thing. 
it's he thinks about getting a phone call from someone telling him that his mother just been in a car crash and has died. And so this is a guy whose mother is still alive and is regularly thinks and meditates on this idea. And it's to reframe straight away. Once he has that, it's like, okay, like relative to that, this kind of business thing that I'm dealing with today or this thing that happened or this person that was rude to me, like doesn't matter. And it's just a, a tool to snap you back to perspective. And I think a lot of, uh, we talk about philosophy or a lot of the old school philosophers and stoic philosophers used to do this. They used to do a thing where they would meditate on the worst possible outcome as opposed to envisioning the best thing, right? They wouldn't have like this positive uh, envisioning. They would go the opposite. They would think about the worst possible scenario and how bad things could potentially be. And then if you imagine what the worst thing could happen, then relative to that, you now have some perspective of uh, the stuff we mainly complain about is just like not worth complaining about the stuff we mainly get sad about is not worth being sad about uh, at least for as long as we maybe do so uh, with all that said uh, for what probably should have been a fairly short question i would say perspective is, is the the big one that we should practice every day yeah i i agree completely and, and as much as we train and, and, and worry about our nutrition for our physical health i think psychological health is just as important and and um, like you said, sometimes you just need to experience those emotions and, and recognize them so that they pass and you don't kind of hold on to them. And uh, exactly, man, it's all about perspective. So that was, that was a phenomenal answer. And um, uh, as far as any plugs that you have you want to kind of throw in um, for the website, for any pr products you're working on, um, for that nutrition course, just uh, let them have it. Cool. So I would say for anyone that's interested in just generally finding more about me or what we have going on, just go to the website, which is just sigmanutrition.com. So S-I-G-M-A nutrition.com. Uh, if you are interested in listening to the podcast, uh, then just search for Sigma Nutrition Radio on pretty much any app. You'll find us there. Uh, the only other things that people might be interested in is if you are interested in some of the areas we touched on in terms of weight cutting and making weight, like I said, uh, I do have a guide published, which you'll find on the website as well, which is the Sigma weight cutting system for MMA and boxing. So if you work with weight class based athletes in, in combat sports specifically, it's a basically a whole blueprint for their general nutrition, for their weight cuts, for the rehydration, all that type of stuff. Um, and if you just go to our current website, if you're more interested in strength sport, so like weightlifting and powerlifting, like I said, there is plans for this uh, a similar guide to be done that will be up in the next couple of months. So if you're listening to this right now when it launches, then it might be a, a few weeks away. But if you just sign up on the email list on the SigmaNutrition.com website, uh, announcements will be going out as soon as that is ready if you are interested. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. In the meantime, people can find me. Just search my name and you'll find me on Facebook. You'll find me on Twitter, Instagram, all that type of stuff. And uh, yeah, send me a message if you listen to this and liked it. Or if you want more information about the upcoming book, all that type of stuff, just message me on social media. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I'm a I'm actually really excited for that that book to release, um, or or that manual for the for the the water cut. I think it's gonna be really interesting. I think um, it's it's gonna be super insightful. So I'll make sure I pick up a copy and and uh, kind of spread that around my circle. So I, I appreciate having you on, man, and and um, I, I really really do appreciate all the information you put out, the guests you have on. Um, and kind of the message you are trying to spread of, of, of critical thinking and um, taking information and not just implementing it, but, but kind of looking at it and, and, and thinking about it beforehand. Um, oh, thanks so much, man. That, that means a lot to hear. And uh, thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate any chance to come and talk about this stuff. So sure. I really appreciate you asking me. Sure. And uh, as far as all the listeners go, if you, if you guys liked what you heard, uh, go check Danny out. Um, if you want to leave a review, go ahead, positive or negative, and uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk to you guys next time.